السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه وبعد So after thanking and praising Allah for what he has conferred upon us of favors and blessings that cannot be counted and enumerated we like to express our uh, gratitude to our Salafi brothers here and Delaware Masjid Ikhlas for extending the invitation to, and likewise their good thoughts regarding their Muslim brother. In order to come with you today to speak regarding this uh, very important topic, a topic concerning a khasla or a characteristic that the Masjid of Allah والسلام, has described as being the characteristic of the religion. For he has said, والسلام, Inna li kulli deenin Indeed, every deen it has a distinguishing characteristic. Every deen has a quality or a characteristic to it. Wa khuluqu al-Islam and the characteristic of al-Islam is al-haya, is that of shame or shy or, mo- or shyness or modesty. And so the intent today, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala, is to look at a statement amongst the statements of the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu salam regarding this very important uh, characteristic. And it is in that which has come on the authority of Abu Mas'ud Uqba ibn Amr al-Ansari al-Badri radiyallahu ta'ala anhu who said qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam inna mimma adraka al-nasu min kalam al-nubuwa al-ula idha lam tastahyi fasna' ma shit that he said that the mission of Allah alayhi wa sallam stated Indeed, from that which the people still have with them, that which the people have encountered from the speech of the first prophethood, is the statement, if you feel no shame or no shyness, fasna mashit, then do whatever it is that you will. Hadith is reported by Al-Bukhari. So we're going to look at, the, look at this narration, inshallah ta'ala, in light of the speech of one of our scholars, that of a sheikh Salih al sheikh But before... Going to the explanation of the narration, we want to look at uh, something brief regarding the biography of the narrator. And the narrator, his name is Abu Mas'ud Uqba ibn Amr al-Ansari al-Badri. It is mentioned concerning his biography that he is Abu Mas'ud Uqba ibn Amr ibn Ta'laba al-Ansari and he is from Banu al-Hadith, from Banu al-Hadith, ibn al-Khazraj. And he, is well known to, he was well known by his kunya, as there are a number of companions who were more known by their kunya than they were by their actual name. He was well known by his kunya, Abu Mas'ud. And he is known as Abu Mas'ud al-Badri. Abu Mas'ud al-Badri. Even though he did not witness the battle of Badr according to many of the people of knowledge. However, he was called al-Badri because he lived near Badr. Because he lived near Badr. And he witnessed the second Al-Aqaba pledge along with the Masjid of Allah alayhi And he at that time was very young in age. And he witnessed the battle of Uhud and all of the other battles that took place thereafter. And Abu Mas'ud died in the year 41 or the year 40 according to some of the historians. And it was stated that he died during the days of Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And at that point in time, Ali, he had placed him in charge of Kufa. He had placed him in charge of Kufa uh, during the days of the Battle of Sifin. As it relates to the narration itself, as Sheikh Saleh, he mentions, هذا الحديث فيه كلام على شعبة من شعبة الإيمان that this narration it contains inside of it speech regarding a branch amongst the branches of faith. As we know that, the narration mentions Al-Iman bidu wa sab'una shu'ba. The Iman is 70 some odd branches. Fa'alaha ish. What's the highest of them? The statement, 
La ilaha illallah wa adnaha, the lowest of them, is to remove something harmful from the pathway. Wal haya shu'batum min al iman. And haya is a branch of al iman. Here you have a, a proof amongst the proofs of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah uh, for the definition of iman as being uh, belief of the heart, statement of the tongue, and action of the limbs. So, where in the narration do we have the action of the limbs? Removal of something harmful from the pathway. Where do we have a statement of the tongue? It's clear. The statement, La ilaha illallah. So where do we have the belief of the heart? Al haya. Okay, al haya is an affair of the heart. It's an affair of the heart. And so, <clears throat> it is a branch amongst the branches of al iman. And that is none other than al haya. وَقَدْ أُسْنِدَ الْكَلَامِ هُنَا إِلَى مَا بَقِيَ لِلنَّاسِ مِنَ النُّبُوَةِ الْأُولَى and so the speech here has been attributed to and attached to that which remained with the people from the first prophethood. فقال, so he said, alayhi salatu wasalam, inna mimma adraka nasu min kalam in nubuwatul ula, and deep from, from that which is still with the people, that which the people have encountered from the speech of the first prophethood. And this necessitates anna hunaka kalam and adraka hunas min kalam al anbiya. This necessitates and, shoot and shows that there is some speech that the people have with them or that they have encountered from the speech of the prophets. And the meaning of al idraq and nahu fashaf and nasi. The meaning of the idraq or the encountering here is that it is it spread amongst the people. It had spread amongst the people and was known amongst them. And they would circulate it one to another. And it reached them from the NBA. It reached them from the prophets themselves. As it relates to his statement, from that which the people have encountered, the min here is tab'idiyya. The min here, it is tab'idiyya, meaning that it is a part of something. It is not the sum of all of the speech which they have from the first prophethood, but it is a part of that. Meaning that there were other speech that was spread amongst the people which was known amongst them to have come from the prophets of old. And this is from that. This statement is a part of that. And so, uh, it is this statement that if you feel no shyness, fuss not, mash it, then do whatever it is that you will. Now, when you bad, ma. أُدْرِكْ مِنْ كَلَامِ النُّبُوَةِ الْأُولَى وَالنُّبُوَةِ الْأُولَى الْمَقْصُودِ بِهَا النُّبُوَاتَ مُتَقَدِّمَةِ Now, and so what is intended by النُّبُوَةِ الْأُولَى The first prophethood, what is intended by way of that is the prophethoods of old. The earlier prophethoods. The earlier prophethoods. Meaning, أَوَائِلْ الرُّسُلِ Meaning from the first and the earliest of the messengers. From the first and the earliest of the messengers and prophets, such as Nuh and Ibrahim, uh, yani, and their likes, because they were from the earliest of the prophets and messengers. When the Nuh and Lohu Kalam Fasha fi atba'ihi fi ma ba'dahu, for Nuh alayhi salam, he was amongst the people for how long giving dawah? 900 years. 900 years? 950? How long did he live? Huh? A thousand? Some of them, they mention that he actually lived to be 1,650. 1,650. So he was Atwal al-Anbiya Umara. He lived the longest out of the prophets. He was known as the longest living prophet. Uh, that 950 years was his da'wah. Was his da'wah amongst them. And so when you're giving da'wah for that long, how much of your speech is going to remain amongst the people? Nuh alayhi salam, he had much speech that uh, was known uh, amongst the people, that, that had spread amongst him and amongst his followers. Ibrahim, similarly, he had speech that was spread from him. وَكَذَلِكَ مِمَّا أَعْطَاهُ اللَّهُ وَأَوْحَاهُ إِلَيْهُ And uh, likewise, there was that speech that Allah Ta'ala had given him and had revealed to him within his scriptures. فالنبوة الأولى المقصود بها النبوات السابقة البعيدة عن إرث الناس لذلك الكلام. 
So when he says that the first prophethood or the first prophethood, what is intended by way of that is the earlier generations of the prophets that were far removed from those people who had actually inherited the speech from them. They were a long way from them. So this term it necessitates that there were earlier prophethoods and there were latter prophethoods. There were earlier prophethoods and there were latter prophethoods. He says, and this is that which is correct. Because if the term is left general, was intended by way of that is the first prophets and messengers. And the first and earlier prophets and messengers. Amma Musa wa Isa, as for Musa and Isa and the likes of them, wa hakada, they uh, uh, and so on and so forth from the from the NBA of Ban Israel, Dawood and other than them, Haula min Nubuwata Muta Akhira. Then they are considered to be from the latter prophets. They're considered to be from the latter prophets. Meaning from the prophets and messengers that came later. Now, as it relates to his statement, from that which the people have encountered from the speech of the first prophethood, it means that this speech, this statement, is a statement of the prophets. It is a statement of the prophets. And therefore, it has its import. And it has its benefits that are connected to it. And it has its importance. He mentions some Arabic language benefits. Because you'll find that some of the uh, manuscripts of the 40 Hadith, they have the word uh, as uh, testahi. Testahi. Now, while others, such as what we have here in front of us, it is testahi. Testahi. And both are correct. Both are linguistically correct. However, uh, as we have asked some of our Mashaykh uh, this morning when we uh, were reviewing for the, for the lesson, uh, Sheikh Mustafa Mabram, he mentioned how linguistically speaking though, because the asl of the word is that it has two yas. The asl of the word is that it has two yas. It is madzum. So therefore, one of them is omitted. One of them is omitted. So that which is correct is that which we have here in front of us linguistically speaking. Although both of them Yani, uh, uh, yani, linguistically sound. Wallahu alam. So we'll bypass this speech regarding uh, yani, the linguistic benefit here. And suffice with that which was mentioned. So he says, Nam, lam testah yi fasda ma shit. He says, Fihi dhik al haya. In this lies a mention of al haya. Wal haya kama jaa fil hadith al akhar. As you mentioned earlier, that other narration which mentions that Haya is a branch amongst the branches of Al Iman. And it is something which is on the inside. The reality of it is that it is something which is on the inside. At times you find that Haya it is innate. Mean that a person is created with it. A person is created with it. It's a part of their natural character. And other times it is, comes by way of al iktisab. It is acquired. So some people, they are naturally modest. They are naturally shy people. While others, they came up a certain way wherein they weren't raised with this characteristic. They didn't have it all their lives. But perhaps Allah Ta'ala favored them with the deen of al Islam. And they learned the virtue of al haya And they began to adopt this as a characteristic of theirs until it became a part of their character. Now, and so, uh, at times it comes like this, and at times it comes that way. As for if it comes naturally, meaning it's innate inside of a person, then about the nashakun hayayan or hayyan, some of the people, they are like this, they are naturally shy and modest. As has come in the authentic narration that a man amongst the Ansar, it is as if he was censoring and rebuking his brother for his, ha for his, his hayat. 
He was, in his viewpoint, a little too shy for a man to be. And so he was rebuking him and censoring him for that. Now, so the Messenger of Allah, alayhi wa upon seeing this, he said, Da'hu, leave him alone. He said, leave him alone. Fin al min al iman. Because that shyness which he has, it is from al iman. It is from al iman. Now, and likewise, it is reported from him authentically that he said, alayhi wa sallam, in another narration, al hayau la yati illa bi khayrin. That haya does not bring along with it except goodness. A person having this, a sense of shyness with himself, a sense of modesty with him or herself, it does not bring along with it except goodness. So haya, it is something, yani, which is a branch of man, as you mentioned, that is batina. It is something which is hidden. It is innate, or it is inside of the person, rather. It is inside of the person. So, regardless of a person may present themselves as though they're a shy person in public, the reality of this affair is that it is batina. It is inside. It is inside. And Allah Ta'ala knows best the people's realities. Now, and so, it is like this, that it comes at times being innate. And at other times, it comes being acquired. It comes being acquired. And if a person does not have it, innately, and then to acquire it and strive to adorn oneself with it and to learn its characteristic and adopt it, it is something which is ma'murun bihi. We've been commanded with that. And we should do so. And we should do so. Now, and we should not be amongst those individuals who think that having a sense of shyness and shame is something which is blameworthy. As we find in this day and time in which we live, Many of the people, they've lost this beautiful characteristic. And they have ridiculous statements such as what? There's no shame in my game. As if shame and shyness is something blameworthy. Now, so we should strive to adorn ourselves with this characteristic. Even if we weren't raised upon it. Even if we didn't have it for much of our lives. It is something which is commanded with. And... We should have a sense of shyness from Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. We're going to see, inshallah, wa ta'ala, and that which is to come, and how some of the mashaykh they have mentioned the levels of this haya, the levels of it. And there are four in number, we will mention that in its place, inshallah. Wa ta'ala. We should have a sense of shyness from Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, such that one strives to remain distant away from the muharramat, those things that are impermissible, out of Shyness from his Lord. And shyness from his Lord seeing him upon a state that is blameworthy. Or falling short in his obligations. Because Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, he loves to see his servant with this characteristic. A sense of shyness from him, Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. And he is pleased with that. So therefore the hayat that is muktasab, that is acquired, it is. Is something or yani, that the individual it was uh, it did not initially have inside of his heart, but he strove until he acquired that, and this is something which is likewise praiseworthy. He mentioned concerning the statement of the Prophet alayhi salam, "Either lam tastahi fasnaq ma shit that if you did not have shyness and do whatever it is that you will, ikhtalafa fihi al ulama ala qawlain." Concerning the meaning of it, concerning the meaning of this statement in the ulama, they have two statements regarding it. They differ, and they have two statements regarding its meaning. The first statement, من ulama من قال إنه أمر They're amongst the ulama, there are those who say that it is a command. There are those who say that it is a command. And they say that the meaning of the hadith, therefore, is that that if whatever affair you intend to do, whatever affair you intend to embark upon, if it does not contain anything within it that one should be ashamed of, then do whatever you wish amongst those actions. If you intend to embark upon something, 
whether it may be some speech that you intend to say, whether it may be some action that you intend to do, some garment that you intend to wear, or what have you, some characteristic that you intend to adorn yourself with, if it does not have anything within it that one should be ashamed of, then feel free to partake in it. Feel free to partake in it. Feel free to make that statement. Feel free to hold that belief. Feel free to do that action or to wear that garment and the likes of that. Feel free to do so. Now, because this is an affair which the believers will not have shyness from, meaning that if that affair is not haram and it does not contain something which goes against and contradicts makaram al-akhlaq or uh, upright moral character and dignity and honor and it does not contain negligence regarding an obligation of Allah Taala wa ta'ala upon you it does not contain any of those things that the legislation deems to be blameworthy then feel free to embark upon that feel free to embark upon that wala tu bali and you don't have anything to worry about you have nothing to worry about because the fact that it does not contain something inside of it that is blameworthy legislatively is an evidence that there's no harm with the action. There's no harm with that action. And this statement is a statement of a group of the people of knowledge from them, Ishaq. Likewise, Imam Ahmed and a large group amongst the people of knowledge. <clears throat> this is the first statement. The second statement amongst the statements of the ulama is that it is not a command. It is not a command. And when you look at it in light of this second statement, it's going to have two possible meanings. So the first statement is that it is a command. The second statement is that it is, a not, is not, a, not a command. Therefore, it not being a command, it will have two possible interpretations. Now, the first wajh, the first possible interpretation. Qalu, they say that, yani, that it is rather a tahdi, it is a threat. It is rather a threat. So it is not a command, but rather a threat. Now, so he is saying, therefore, if you have no shame, if you are the type of person that has no shame with yourself, then you are subject to do anything. You are subject to do anything. Nah, meaning that whoever does not have shame that will prevent him from embarking upon things that are haram, that will prevent him from speaking a certain way, from saying certain things, doing certain things, or will prevent her from broadcasting her sins upon social media, that will prevent you from being in a situation that you know you should not be in. If you have no shame that will prevent you from these things, Fussing out my shit. You're going to find such a person doing whatever. They will do whatever they want to do. Now, and this statement is similar to the statement of Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, where he said, Say that the haq is from your Lord. So whoever wills, let him believe. Whoever wills, let him disbelieve. It is not a license to disbelieve. It is not a license to disbelieve. Rather, it is a tahdeed. It is a threat for the one who chooses to do so. A threat for the one who chooses to do so. Now, so he mentions that for the one who does not have any haya inside of him, there's no good in him. That individual who has no haya that will be a means of checking him from saying certain things, doing certain things, being caught in certain situations. There is no haya that will check him or stop him or her from that. There's no khair, no good in such a person. There's no good in such an individual. So therefore, by way of this, the narration comes indicating a tahdeed. It comes indicating a tahdeed. Now, Ibn Taymiyyah, he mentioned that al-haya 
it is mushtaqa, it is extracted from or derived from the word al hayah, meaning what? Life. Life. It, so it comes from the word that means life. So therefore, Ibn Taymi mentions that the one who has no haya in him, it's as if he has no life. It's as if he has no life. A dead man walking, as they say. And so, the second waj, the second possible interpretation or meaning, when you look at it as not being an amr or a command, is that a group of the people of knowledge stated that it comes bearing the meaning of a khabar of some information about the people's state and condition. That when the people do not feel shyness or shame from certain things, you're going to find the people doing all types of affairs. All types of affairs. They will do all types of things. Why? Because there is no shame to prevent them from doing those things. It is khabar. It is information informing you about the reality of people. That once shyness and shame is removed, then the people will do whatever they feel. They will do whatever it is that they want to do. And so these are the two statements amongst the statements of the ulama regarding the interpretation of the meaning of this narration. But shyness, however, it has that from it which is blameworthy. It has that from it that which is blameworthy. And that which is blameworthy from it is shyness that will prevent a person from one from enjoining the good and prohibiting the evil while he has the ability to do so. So your shyness should not prevent you from enjoining the good and prohibiting the evil if you have the ability to do so. You should not be so shy that you don't want to speak a word of truth. You don't want to speak a word of truth when that word of truth needs to be spoken. As the Bashan of Allah he was shy. He had shyness to the point that he was described in his shyness as having a shyness that was similar to the shyness of the virgin girls. He, was, he had extreme shyness. So your shyness, yet you find that the mission of Allah, he would become angry for the sake of Allah Ta'ala whenever he saw the sanctities of Allah being violated, or Allah's religion being violated, he became angry for the sake of Allah Azawajal. His shyness would not prevent him from Speaking a word of truth. And likewise, shyness, it should not prevent one from seeking beneficial knowledge. Shyness should not prevent an individual from seeking beneficial in. You have this narration that comes on the authority of Um Sulaim, Al Ansariya, radiallahu ta'ala anha. That she came to ask the Messenger of Allah, alayhi wa sallam, wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, inna Allah la yastahyi min al-haq. O Messenger of Allah, indeed Allah Ta'ala is not shy from the truth. He does not shy away from telling the truth. Fahal ala mar'a ghusrun idha tumilat. Is it upon the woman to perform ghusl if she has a wet dream? The nature of this question is something that one will be customarily shy from mentioning. But it's in the affair of seeking beneficial knowledge. Seeking beneficial knowledge and seeking a ruling amongst the rulings of the religion. So shyness should not prevent one from seeking beneficial knowledge and seeking a ruling when, we, when you are in need of that ruling. As Um Sulaim came and she asked this question and the Messenger of Allah informed her, Naam, yes, it is upon her to make ghusl. If she sees the fluid, if she sees the fluid. Some of the ulama they have mentioned, or they have categorized shyness into various types. And from those types, there are four. So if you're taking notes, take these notes, inshallah. The first of them you heard throughout the course of the, of the talk, and that is Hayat min Allah. Having al haya, having shyness from Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, which is the first. The second of them, al haya min al malaika, having shyness from the angels. Having shyness from the angels. The third of them, al haya min al nas, having al haya from the people. Having shyness from the people. The fourth, 
al haya min al nafs having shyness within yourself having shyness within or from yourself as it relates to the first of them it was what shyness from who allah tabarak wa ta'ala and so when an individual has within himself shyness from allah tabarak wa ta'ala this will lead the individual to strive to stay away from those things that Allah has made impermissible, strive to stay away from falling short in his obligations because he does not want his Lord to see him upon his state. So he has shyness from Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. His shyness from Allah azawajal prevents him from doing certain things, acting a certain way, being in certain situations, broadcasting his sins for the whole world to see. To the point that you find some individuals even boasting and bragging about disobedience to Allah Taala, wa ta'ala. Boasting and bragging about it. Shyness should prevent an individual from doing any of that. Shyness from Allah Taala, wa ta'ala. Because the individual knows that Allah Taala sees him in whatever situation he's within. There's nowhere that you can go when Allah Taala does not see you. So Allah Ta'ala mentions, Alam ya'lam bi anna Allah yara. Does he not know that Allah Ta'ala is looking at him? He sees him when he is alone in that room with that phone. Allah Ta'ala sees her when she is alone in her house with that computer. Allah Ta'ala sees you in that situation. Alam ya'lam bi anna Allah yara. Because of the way that the individuals act and as if they don't know. Do they not know or does he not know that Allah Ta'ala is watching him and sees him? Shyness from Allah Ta'ala wa Ta'ala it has come in this authentic narration from the Messenger of Allah alayhi wa sallam that it's been authenticated by Imam Al-Albani greatest Sahih within his book Sahih Al-Jami' He said min Allah haqq al He told his companions have a shyness from Allah as shyness should be had from him فَقَالُوا يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ They said, O Messenger of Allah, إِنَّا نَسْتَحْيِ Indeed, we have shyness from Allah. We are shy from Allah. قَالَ He said, لَيْسَ ذَاكُمْ It is not as you say, or not as you think. But rather, he says, وَلَكِنْ مَنَ اسْتَحْيَ مِنَ اللَّهِ حَقُّ الْحَيَا The individual who has shyness from Allah, shyness should be had from him. فَلْيَحْفَظْ الرَّسْ وَمَا وَعَى He will safeguard his head. And what he allows to enter into it. From music, from the speech of Ahl al-Bid'ah, from يعني, movies and the likes of that, he will safeguard his head and what he allows to enter into it. Now, well, button, woman, hawa, he will safeguard his belly and what he allows to enter into that. From alcohol, from consuming the wealth of others unjustly from any means that were ill-gotten and the likes of that, he will safeguard his belly and what he allows to enter into it. He says, And he will remember death. He will remember death and that true calamity, meaning Yawm Al-Qiyamah. وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةِ تَرَكَ زِينَةَ الدُّنْيَا and the one who truly desires the hereafter, he will abandon those temporary and fleeting beautiful things of this dunya. The one who does all of that has had shyness from Allah Ta'ala as shyness should be truly had from him. The second of them was what? Shyness from the angels. Shyness from those angels who do not leave your side, who see you upon every state and condition and are writing down those actions that you do. One should have shyness from those angels such that he does not want those angels, those righteous servants of Allah Ta'ala to witness him or her upon some improper situation or characteristic or speech or action. Some of the Sahaba, they said, 
ma'akum men la yufariqukum. You have along with you those who don't leave you. You have along with you those who do not leave you, meaning your scribe angels. Fastahyu minhum. So therefore, be shy of them and have respect for them. And have respect for them. Allah Ta'ala, he has alerted us to this reality wherein he said, Indeed, you have along with you preserving angels. Hiramen katibin. He described them as being hiram. They are noble, meaning they are not ignoble. They are not yani, a creation that is lowly and despicable. Rather, they are noble, as Allah Ta'ala described them. And he has described them as katibin, writers or scribes. Ya'lamuna ma taf'alun. They know that which you do. They know that which you do. When you're in that situation where you think you're alone, you're not alone. You're not alone. Allah Ta'ala sees you. And he has angels that are there with you, preserving and writing down your statements and your actions. Ibn Qayyim mentions, I, commenting upon this set of verses, Meaning, estahyu min ha'ula al hafidin al kiram. Meaning, be shy from these noble, preserving angels. Wa akrimuhum. And have respect for them. Honor them. He says, and be ashamed that they should see you upon some state or condition that you will be ashamed from someone who is like you seeing you do. Meaning just as you would be shy from an elder or from a respected uh, any, uh, a member of your community, whether it is a relative or some respected brother in the community. And in some individuals, they may do some things, and if an elder from the community were to, were to bend the corner and see you doing that, you may have a heart attack. You may fall out. Now, so just as you would have respect from someone who was similar to you, meaning a human being just like you, have respect from those angels. Have respect from those angels. He says, well, malaika mimma yata'adha minhu banu Adam. Because the angels are offended by those things that offend the children of Adam. They are offended by those things that offend the children of Adam. He says, For either kana banu Adam yata'adha mimman yafjur wa ya'si bayna yaday. If it is the case that the son of Adam he would be offended if he were to see somebody committing fujur, wickedness, and transgression, and sin, and disobeying Allah Ta'ala in front of him, even if he were to do that very same sin, even if he were to secretly do that very same sin, but you were to do that in front of him, he may be offended by way of that. What makes you think you can do that in front of me? What makes you think I want to be a party to your sin and your disobedience? Even if he struggles with the same thing in the prophecy of his own home, he would be offended by way of that. What do you think about the angels who never commit sins? They never commit sins. They never disobey Allah Ta'ala. They would be even more so offended. So we should have shyness from those angels. Thirdly, one has al haya from the people. One has haya from the people. From the ridiculous statements that we hear from some of the juhalists, they say, well, I'm grown. I'm grown. And we were taught, yani, even from quote-unquote jahili wisdom, that being grown doesn't mean what? It doesn't mean that you do what you want to do. It means you do what you're supposed to do. It doesn't mean that you just go about doing and saying any of your thing. Rather, you do and you say what is proper if you're truly grown. If you're truly grown. Now, nah, but some of the people, they think like this. And they have no shyness from whoever sees them doing whatever they may see them do. And they think that this is something which is praiseworthy. They think that this is something which is noble. And they think that to hide and cover your shortcomings and your sins and to conceal them is from some type of two-facedness or hypocrisy. La Allah. It's not the case. It is not the case. Rather, you should hide your shortcomings. Hide your sins and don't be so bold as to 
as to do these sins, as to do these sins for the whole world to see, not having any shame from the people whatsoever. Hudayfa ibn Yaman he said, "La khayra fi man la yistahi min al-nas." There's no good in a person who does not have shyness from the people. Person just doesn't care whoever sees him doing what. Hudayfa says, "What? There's no good in such a person. There's no good in this individual." Now, <clears throat> and so therefore, he says, so whatever you would hate that the people should see you doing openly, then don't do it even when you're in private. Don't do it even when you're in private. Which brings us to the fourth and final type and category of haya, and that is what? It is what? Shining from yourself. There's certain things that you just won't do. Should be certain things that you just won't do. Have a sense of self-worth. Have a sense of valuing who you are as a Muslim. Who you are as a Muslim man, as a Muslim woman. Certain things and situations you just won't get caught dead in, inshallah ta'ala. You should have shyness from yourself. As some of the salat they would say, Man amala fi sir amalan yastahi minhu fil alaniya. Whoever does an action in private that he would be shy to do in public, he has no sense of self-worth. He has no sense of self-worth. He doesn't believe that he is worth anything. He himself doesn't even believe that he's worth anything. Because he does things in private that he is scared to do in front of the people. So the person should likewise have a sense of shyness from him or herself such that they just won't do certain things. They just won't say certain things or get caught in certain situations. This is that which we wanted to mention as a brief reminder to ourselves and you, likewise, concerning this highly important topic. And there's much more that can be said regarding it, but we will suffice with that which, which, which has been mentioned. Allah ta'ala is best. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barik. Ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa khiru da'wana. And alhamdulillahi wa barakatuh.